In this presentation module, we talk about logic locking basics. So we first start by talking about key management issues. How do we load the key, load the secret key on the chip uh, to unlock and activate the chip? And then we move on to the early efforts in logic locking. So first, uh, key management and logic locking. Um, after we insert the key gates and then we produce a correct key that would make the design operational, um, one way is to use the same key, which we call the KC or the common key, for all the chips that is uh, manufactured based on a certain design, a uh, logic lock design. So this KC uh, needs to be loaded on a secure uh, tamper-proof memory or it could be also hard-coded in terms of e-fuses, but this has to be done by a trusted party. And in this particular case, the trusted party is the designer themselves because it's the KC is the secret of the designer. So once KC is loaded on the tamper-proof memory or when, when it's hard-coded, then the chip is unlocked, it's activated, and it becomes operational. So this is, this is one approach. Um, the downside is you have one key for uh, all the chips that are manufactured off of that uh, logic lock design. So if the key is compromised, all the chips are compromised. So as a remedy, uh, the other approach would be to use unique keys for every chip. Uh, in this particular case, we also need some additional hardware on chip. Um, a simple XOR operation would do, actually. So to produce this common key, KC, um, on-chip XR operations performed between the key that is loaded on the tamper-proof memory and between the key that is loaded on a uh, non-volatile memory that we refer to as the user key and it's the case KIC and KU that are XR on-chip to produce the common key KC. So in this scheme uh, the common key is the secret of the designer um, KIC is also the secret of the designer but KU need not be secret. So the loading of KIC uh, on the secure uh, tamper-proof memory or uh, hard-coding it in terms of e-fuses is the task of the trusted party, in other words, the designer. Um, loading of the user key to unlock and activate the chip is done by the user, which need not be a trusted party. So once the user loads the KU uh, key on a on the memory, non-volatile memory, it doesn't need to be tamper-proof. Uh, the chip is unlocked, activated, and it becomes operational. So different chips, although they're developed from the same uh, logic lock design, have different uh, keys, different user keys. Compromising one key does not compromise uh, another key that belongs to another chip. So this was a picture that uh, we showed when we first talked about logic locking. It's the evolution of logic locking, various approaches in terms of defenses and attacks. Uh, in this presentation module, we'll cover the early efforts in logic locking, uh, namely random logic locking and fault analysis based logic locking. And the subsequent modules will touch upon other approaches as well. So in random logic locking, the idea is very simple. Um, key gates are simply inserted at random locations on the netlist. This was the very first approach in logic locking. It was proposed in 2008 um, by two groups, uh, University of Michigan and Rice, and uh, it basically produces a key that protects the design, but the key gate locations are uh, chosen at random. And in fault analysis based logic locking, which we developed a few years back, the idea is to insert key gates and make sure that the outputs are corrupted. And the corruption level can be controlled by choosing the key, uh, the location of the key gates judiciously. Um, why did we propose fault impact based logic locking? Well, we observed that uh, random logic locking could possibly be ineffective when an attacker wants to use the chip, the logic lock chip as a black box, um, even with incorrect keys, if the corruption level is not sufficient and the chip outputs could be uh, almost correct in, in some of the cases and uh, this would basically allow the attacker to use the chip as a black box. Um, in logic locking that is driven by fault impact based analysis 
or in, in short we call it FLL, um, the idea is to corrupt 50% uh, of the outputs uh, and insert key gates to make sure that this 50% corruption is delivered. Now why 50%? Um, the, the reason is when half of the outputs are corrupted and this half differs from one input to the next, that will create maximal ambiguity for the attacker uh, to understand the black box uh, behavior of the chip. That's why uh, fault analysis based logic locking inserts key gates to make sure that half of the outputs are corrupted for uh, different inputs. Um, and this is done based on a fault analysis. Obviously, in the previous module, we talked about relating faults to the application of incorrect keys. So we identify the location of stuck at faults, where, which are most influential in terms of propagating to the outputs. And uh, we insert the, the key gates in those locations. So in this, in this slide, uh, we compare random logic locking to fault analysis based logic locking. And what we observe is that in fault analysis based logic locking, we reach this 50% corruption level upon inserting fewer uh, number of uh, key gates as opposed to random logic locking, which sometimes may not even guarantee uh, that corruption level at the outputs. Uh, in fault analysis based logic locking, we reach either 50% or close to 50% and we maintain that corruption level um, even if we increase the key size. So in this, in this module we talked about uh, logic locking basics, we talked about different ways to do uh, logic locking key management and we visited the early efforts in logic locking, namely random logic locking and fault analysis based logic locking. Thank you very much for listening.